week's installment of our Florida Talks at Home series. My name is Keith Simmons. I'm the Communications Director at Florida Humanities. And tonight we have a very special program with Dr. Reginald Ellis at FAMU. We're going to talk about the history of Florida A&M University. Before I turn the program over to Dr. Ellis, there's a few things that I wanted to mention um, as we get started with tonight's program. Florida Humanities, by the way, is partnering with humanities organizations across Florida to provide more of these Florida Talks programs to you. A number of them are doing things like Florida Talks at home, but there are also some who are doing things in person, observing social distancing and the like um, that are going on right now. So um, you can visit floridahumanities.org slash events to see the most current list of upcoming programs. And I wanna take a moment and spotlight two programs that we have coming up. Um, the first is a talk by Dr. Darius Young, also at FAMU, about the university's hospital and its history. FAMU Hospital played not only a critical role in providing health care for the Tallahassee area for years, but it also served as a critical testing and vaccination site for COVID-19. And that program is going to take place next Tuesday, April 13th at 530. And the second program I wanted to mention is one that we're doing in partnership with Braver Angels. We're hosting a two-part workshop to help people communicate across the political divide. This program will bring together a small group of reds or conservatives and blues or liberals to have structured conversation and improve their ability to engage with those they disagree with. Plus, there are opportunities for others to observe this conversation taking place. Um, it's a two-part program and it takes place on April 24th and May 1st, both from 1 to 4 p.m. So you can learn more about those programs and you can register for them by going to floridahumanities.org slash events. Now at the end of tonight's presentation, you will receive a short feedback survey in your email. We would greatly appreciate you taking a minute to fill it out for us. Let us know how we did, things that we can improve next time, and any topics that you might be interested in hearing about for the future. By the way, if you have any questions during tonight's presentation, uh, you can type them down in the chat field below, and we're going to do our best to try to work in as many questions as we can uh, into tonight's conversation. And finally, your support is essential for helping to sustain these programs. If you find this program engaging, inspiring in any way, we ask that you consider visiting floridahumanities.org support to contribute to our organization and to continue to make programs like this possible. So again, tonight we welcome Dr. Reginald Ellitz, the Associate Dean of the School of Graduate Studies and Research and an Associate Professor of History at Florida a and University. Dr. Ellis specializes in African-American history and the history of black education. He is the author of Between Washington and Du Bois, The Racial Politics of James Edward Shepard, along with being a co-editor of Repression, Reform and Revolution, New Studies on the Long Civil Rights Movement. And Dr. Ellis is also a member of the Board of Directors for Florida Humanities. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Dr. Ellis. Uh, thank you, Keith. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Before I get started, I wanted to, again, uh, thank Keith uh, for the invitation to present this evening on the history of Florida and m University in general, but in particular, looking at our first president, a uh, gentleman by the name of Thomas DeSell Tucker. Um, I want to welcome everyone into the room uh, this evening. I will give a traditional lecture format with a PowerPoint, uh, but please, uh, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat at the end. I look forward to engaging you all uh, on this topic. And before I forget, uh, as a member of the, the Board of Florida Humanities, I want to make sure that you know how, how grateful we are uh, for you all being here this evening. And also any support that you can give us uh, will be greatly appreciated as we continue uh, to enhance the humanities uh, throughout the state of Florida. Uh, thank you. Uh, so my talk <coughs> is entitled, A Florida State Normal and Industrial School for Colors, Thomas D. Sellier Tucker and his radical approach uh, to black higher education. Um, and so I'm gonna start and then I'll move the slide uh, as we go. Um, on the eve of post-war reconstruction in the South, prominent African-Americans long for an institution 
that would lead to the advancement of the entire race, focusing their attention on politics and understanding the need for an intelligent voting mass. These leaders emphasized the crucial role that education would play in transforming black life throughout the country. Importantly, in the late 19th century, the debate over the proper education of African Americans emerged as a central issue in the black experience. Historian and sociologist W.E.B. Du Bois led the charge in declaring that African Americans were capable of being trained in liberal arts education, which would ultimately achieve Bishop Henry L. Morehouse's goal of creating a talented tent within the black community. Once properly trained, this group of educated leaders could instruct the masses on African Americans and dem democratic Protestant values. On the other hand, using Samuel Armstrong's model book of vocational education for African Americans, Booker T. Washington argued for the acceptance of agricultural and industrial education for the masses of the black population that was only a few decades removed from slavery. Importantly, many white philanthropists of the late 19th and early 20th century sided with Washington's approach of industrial education for African Americans and therefore supported educational institutions that used this approach. With Washington and the Tuskegee Institute held as the models for black education in the South, white political leaders began to support the idea of establishing institutions of higher education that created better Negroes, not smarter ones, trained to be punctual, diligent, and obedient uh, would be better to serve to would be better able to serve rather the white business community at the dawn of the second industrial revolution. Um, despite the popularity of the Tuskegee model with whites, many African American leaders had their own idea about the proper education for their people, which included forms of liberal arts as well as industrial education. As historian Amakar Shabazz just demonstrates in his work, Advancing Democracy, Black leaders who fought to, for the creation of educational institutions had no interest in inter integrated school systems. Their ultimate desire was to obtain sufficient funding for the creation and maintenance of their own Black institutions. While many early Black colleges faced de facto segregation, schools that were still created schools that were created following the Supreme Court decision of the of the Plessy v. Ferguson decision uh, confronted the Supreme Court decision of the Plessy v. Ferguson uh, confronted an overt system of de jure segregation. Whether segregated by custom or law, these institutions had to appear non-threatening to their white benefactors by revealing themselves to, to schools that promoted the training of better Negroes, not smarter ones. This lecture will therefore examine the creation of the Florida State Normal and Industrial School for Coloreds, predecessor of Florida Agriculture and Mechanical University, while also detailing the role of its first president, Thomas D. Cell Tucker. Acting through his institution, Tucker played a crucial role in American history as he created a black state supported college with a liberal arts curriculum in the era of Booker T. Washington. Furthermore, this work will analyze the role of the black middle class in shaping the ideas of black colleges and universities at the turn of the 20th century. To gain a better appreciation of the early years of FSNIS, it is important to understand the man who was chosen to lead the institution in its infancy. Thomas Tucker was born in Victoria in Cerebro, Sierra Leone, on July 24, excuse me, July 21st, 1844. His mother was the hereditary princess of Cerebro, which made him an African prince. The name Tucker came from an Englishman on his paternal side. Sellers traces his origins to an ancient noble family in Marcellus of Eastern France. At the age of 12, young Tucker traveled to the United States with the missionary of the American Missionary Association, George Thompson, to complete his education, which led the young scholar to Oberlin 
to Ohio Oberlin College, uh, the chief objective of the AMA uh, prior to the end of, the, of slavery was to promote the, Christ, the belief in Christianity while educating freedom, freedmen in the basic forms of education. Uh, the next phase of the, the work that I look at shows the struggles uh, that Thomas Tucker had while he was at Oberlin. Uh, he actually ran out of money um, and he was um, sent to Fortress Monroe uh, to actually earn money as a teacher. And once he got to Fortress Monroe, he actually instructed runaway slaves there. Uh, this is about around 1861. He instructed uh, runaway slaves uh, in an AMA school uh, in Hampton Roads, uh, in the Hampton Roads, Virginia area. Uh, so I'll pick up uh, at the end of his time at Fortress Monroe and at the, the end of his time at his Oberlin experience. He was able to earn enough money to go back to Oberlin and, and, and achieve his, and earn his degree um, at this liberal arts uh, institution in Ohio. Uh, the years at Fortress Monroe for Tucker were profitable and productive. These years gave him the opportunity to uplift and educate the newly freed African-Americans. Tucker later graduated uh, from Oberlin College in 1865, the same year that African-Americans emerged from its Civil War. Following graduation, he moved to Kentucky and opened a day and night school for the education of the newly freed race. Uh, after living in Kentucky for a while, he moved to Louisiana, where he focused on elevating his race. His tastes and inclinations led him to the study to the study of law at Strait University, present day Dillard University, where he received his law degree in 1882. A few years later, after opening a successful law practice with partner R.B. Elliott in New Orleans, Tucker decided to take his talents to the booming black metropolis of Pensacola. Uh, where he met law partner J.D. Thompson and gained a large clientele. Tucker's new home in Pensacola proved influential in his future appointment as the first president of the FSNIS. Upon his arrival in the, to Florida's panhandle in 1884, Pensacola's black community was, quote, about as prosperous as any of their race in the South. Therefore, this move proved not only to be a great business venture, but timely positioning for Tucker's future leadership uh, in Florida. During the same time that Tucker moved to Florida, the black middle class of that state began to assert themselves as the leaders of their race. For example, uh, 200 of the most prominent black men uh, excuse me, 200 of the most prominent black leaders met in Gainesville, Florida for the state conference of the colored men of Florida. This meeting was scheduled to create a plan for African Americans in Florida a few years removed from the false promises of post-Civil War reconstruction. Well aware of the political unrest within the state of Florida and on the national level, the, this meeting addressed issues of local and national civil rights. One issue that the leaders of this convention discussed was the Danville Riot or Danville Massacre. This event that took place in Danville, Virginia in 1883 focused on the new racial etiquettes in that era. The, as African Americans began to step out of their place, racial tensions escalated, eventually leading to a massacre. As racial roles continued to change in Virginia, white traditionalists desired to redeem their positions in Dansville. And as much, quote, white Democrats took control of the city and spread rumors of black insurrection throughout the state. According to historian Jan Daly, the event muffled any attempt that the black community had in gaining any political capital in Virginia during the election of 1883. Furthermore, the role of racial violence and politics spread from state to state, and this successful display of intimidation discouraged the black community from participating in the political process. With the Danville incident serving as the backdrop for the convention, leaders urged its members to devise a plan that would create a more intelligent voting mass. 
At this convention, over 200 prominent black leaders of the state met to discuss pertinent issues concerning the future of, for, of the African-American community. Local mainstream media outlets covered the convention with varying views of the total outcome. For example, the Florida Time Union gave a synopsis of the convention two days following the proceeding. The editor of the paper recalled the voice of one of the most prominent spokesmen of education at the convention, John Willis Menard. Uh, John Willis Menard responded to questions of separation of the races prior to the Plessy v. Ferguson decision by stating, quote, if we must have separate schools and separate cars, let them have the same conveyances and advantages as those provided to whites. Moreover, Menard and other leaders uh, of the convention argued that proper education would ensure an intelligent voting mass throughout the state and the nation. Therefore, this group decided to use its last bit of political capital on black education. This would serve as an investment that would hopefully pay off for black Floridians for generations. In an attempt to downplay the influence of the Negro convention had in the political arena in Florida, one editor of the Florida Times Union described this meeting as an overall failure. The writer explains that the members of the convention only desired to gain the support of the new independent party, which in his personal view was largely a disaster. Obviously a Southern traditionalist, the writer proclaimed that quote, the old cries for Ku Klux and Negro supremacy uh, are things of the past and will soon be entirely driven from the arena of state politics. While conservative white Floridians lambasted the convention, black Floridians praised the meeting and its leaders for creating the plan that they perceive as advancing the community. Moreover, the black press viewed the convention as a response to the reemergence of old Southern traditions. For example, one editor of the New York Globe reported shortly after the convention that the desire of the members of the, the members participated at the meeting was to maintain respect to, to ma maintain respect in the state while gaining both civil and human rights. After much debate over the proper way to reach their goal, the leaders of the convention decided to push for stronger education for African Americans in the state of Florida. Black journalists and, and political spokesman John Willis Menard sparked the idea of a state-supported institution for advanced education for African Americans in the state. Menard's son-in-law, Thomas Van Ranslar Gibbs, had spearheaded the idea's implement, implementation. Gibbs, also the son of the state's distinguished former superintendent of public instruction, Jonathan C. Gibbs, uh, achieved enactment of necessary legislation and financial support as a delegate of the 1885 Florida Constitutional Convention and as a state representative. When news that an all black state supported institution would be created reached Floridians, white traditionalists acknowledged the weakness of their political leaders as it pertained to quote, the race question. One conservative thinker demonized the intelligence of the black voting population in a letter to the New York Freedmen shortly after the at the legislation passed to create a state supported uh, state supported educational institution for African Americans, the author of the uh, this note proclaimed that quote the coloreds have a great deal of political power, but they do not seem to understand it. Obviously upset with the notion of a of a growing black middle class, the writer argued that these classes of African Americans quote render you as much service as a goose. Moreover, the writer argued that, quote, yet they dress in fine, they dress fine, smoke fine cigars, and visit frequently bad dens, and their heads are as empty as a gourd, unquote. Sentiments of this sort explain the fear that many white Southerners had of African-Americans 
in positions of authority. Images of blacks dressed in traditional Victorian garb and carrying themselves eloquently debunk stereotypes that white Southerners previously uh, placed on them. This breaking out of sorts also followed Southern blacks, uh, also, excuse me, allowed Southern blacks a chance to mirror the lives of the middle class, uh, which would potentially work to break down stereotypes of white superiority. While Southern whites express their dissatisfaction with the creation and support of an institution of higher education for blacks, a question as to who would lead the school arose among the political leaders of Florida. Many black and white Floridians assumed that Thomas Tucker would step into the presidency. White political leaders desired someone else, a fact that would carry a major would carry major implications for the institution's future administrators. This came about because former Confederate General Edward A. Perry of Pensacola had assumed the governor's chair in 1885. Perry subsequently had overseen the Constitution's rewriting and generally acted to revolutionize state government with the aim of reversing Reconstruction era trends and policies. It appears likely that Perry and his advisors mistrusted Gibbs, whose connection within the black social and political circle ran to the highest levels. In these circumstances, Perry surprisingly turned to fellow Pensacola resident to take FSNIS's ham, and he likely did so based upon the advice from unexpected sources. The turn of events reflected uh, relationships tested over decades. First, Perry's immediate predecessor as governor, William D. Blossom, had assumed office as Secretary of State and as such sat on the Board of Education. Blossom, meanwhile, had enjoyed a extremely close uh, association since the Civil War's end with Leon County's state sen senator, John Wallace. In, in turn, Wallace had kept close ties with his fellow Black Civil War veteran and one-time congressman, Hosiah T. Walls. Interestingly, at the time, Wallace and Walls had been well acquainted for almost qu one quarter of a century with Pensacola attorney Thomas Tucker. The relationship traced back to the Civil War when the lawyer likely taught the two public officials at the Army's Mary S. Peake School in Hampton, Virginia. Wallace and Walls were then serving in Company D, 2nd United States Infantry. At the school, Tucker and the other instructors combined basic academic exercises with liberal doses of religious training. Whether Walls Wallace retained the former cannot be ascertained, but they did not forget Tucker. Available evidence, although spotty, suggests that they recommended Tucker to Blossom, who in turn pressed his name upon the governor as the proper man to head the state normal school. Prior to taking the reins of FSNIS, Tucker had asserted himself as a leader in Pensacola's black community. In April 1887, shortly before uh, he was chosen as the first president of the school, his wife, Charity Bishop Tucker, accepted a teaching position at a new public school in Pensacola for Blacks. Uh, in support of his wife's new career, the lawyer gave a lecture on home training to parents that, quote, did not know how to raise their children, unquote. The lecture was not uncommon for African Americans in the black middle class as, as the leaders of their race during the late 1800s desired to train their future leaders in the norms of Victorian society. On September 24, 1887, only 19 days after delivering his quote training address, Tucker was selected as the first president of FSNIS. Obviously reluctant to take this position miles from home in Tallahassee, Tucker nevertheless submitted to the call to duty, the call to duty, and arrived in the Florida capital a few days prior to the first classes. During his initial year at this new school, his wife Charity remained in Pensacola to hone her teaching skills. On October 3rd, 
On October 3rd, 1887, the Florida State Normal and Industrial School for Colors opened its doors to 15 students. Initially, however, admittance into the school proved difficult. According to FAMU historian Lee Dale Neyland, admission was restricted to persons 16 years of age and over, facing the challenge of educating individuals who were only 22 years removed from slavery. The 43-year-old Tucker and his new partner in education, Thomas Van Ranslide Gibbs, quote, deemed necessary to examine all newcomers and place them in categories of of, on the basis of the scores received. Therefore, the courses of study were divided into preparatory and normal school. Surprisingly, an upstart black college during the late 1800s, 1880s rather, the normal department course consisted of Latin, higher mathematics, physiology, astronomy, general history, rhetoric, pedagogics, and natural, mental, and moral philosophy. On the other hand, the preparatory department courses consisted of algebra and Latin, while focusing on a concise review of educational practices. According to historian James D. Anderson, black higher education during the, the late 19th century was focused on rudimentary education with an emphasis on industrial and vocational training. Therefore, Tucker's curriculum at FSNIS was totally out of step with other black educational institutions, especially Southern based black educational institutions during its era. With one year under his belt, Tucker began to assert himself in Tallahassee as the preeminent leader of uh, four blacks in the state of Florida. The president gained approval from the state legislator uh, to hire another instructor at the institution. With his first hire, Tucker appointed Laura Clark, a graduate of Wilberforce College, the first female instructor uh, uh, at the school. Clark lightened Tucker's teaching load by instructing English and literature courses in the preparatory department. The three instructors were surprisingly paid on par with white normal schools of the state. With Tucker's annual uh, salary equaling $1,100, Gibbs $1,000, and the newly hired Clark salary $700. This sign of confidence from the state official launched the Tucker administration into full gear as his vision for the institution continued to grow. Building on the momentum of the new president, uh, black leaders in the state decided to create a chapter of the Colored State Teachers Association, elected Tucker as the organization's first president on July 11, 1889. Along with Tucker, fellow FS FSNIS instructor Thomas Gibbs joined the new teacher association. The members of the the members of this meeting desired to place their full support behind FSNIS and other Black educational institutions throughout the state, which will fulfill their their mission that was created at the state convention in 1884, which again was to create a more intelligent voting mass. While serving the entire population of the state of Florida as the educational leader, their educational leader, Tucker focused on the progress of FSNIS. In September 1889, the staff of the Young Institution released its course catalog, which was viewed as a neatly printed pamphlet of 16 pages. The catalog revealed the number of students at the school and the course offerings. Moreover, the overall purpose of the pamphlet was to assure the citizens of the state of Florida that their tax dollars were not being spent in vain. For example, the catalog expressed their quote, that their quote, expense account for the year can easily be kept under $100, unquote. At the end of the academic year, the institution celebrated its third annual closing exercise. The event marks the culmination of the educational experiences for the pupils while giving the public an opportunity to see the depth of the knowledge that these new intellectuals gained while at FSNIS. Although almost totally conducted by the new graduates, the commencement exercise offered the audience an insightful look at their future leaders. 
A number of prominent figures from both races attended the ceremony, including State Superintendent Major A.J. Russell and Black physician William John Gunn. Governor Francis Fleming was not in attendance due to his uh, reported illness, which kept him incapacitated for many days. Overall, the progress of the young institution surprised many people of both races. As the Tucker administration continued to flourish, Black leaders throughout the state continued to support their vision for the institution. Members of the Colored Teachers Association passed a resolution claiming that, quote, members of the association will use every energy to encourage schools and increase the attendance of the same. While Tucker received well wishes from uh, black leaders, conservative politicians had another idea uh, for the curriculum of FSNIS. As early as 1891, the institution began to hire more agricultural and industrial uh, instructors, which will ultimately appease white political leaders. At the start of the academic year in 1891, the school employed W.J. Clayton, a 1891 graduate of Hampton College. Clayton trained students in the agriculture department, which marked the beginning of the end of the prominent presence of, liberal, of the liberal arts curriculum at FSNIS. Tucker's influence over the curriculum of FSNIS dwindled while Booker T. Washington one of the most prominent leaders of the black of black education group. Nonetheless, Tucker's ideas of creating a prominent black middle class never faltered. This cannot be this can best be described in his address to the graduating class in 1895, the same year that Booker T. Washington gained national acclaim for his famous Atlanta Cotton State Exposition address. While Washington argued for black Southerners uh, to remain on the land they knew and to master skills that they had learned during slavery, Tucker encouraged his graduates to carry themselves in a respectful manner while creating a positive image that would elevate the race. Washington argued that the black population would become economically independent and ultimately self-reliant if they followed his plan. On the other hand, a few miles south in Tuskegee, Alabama, uh, uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, from Tuskegee, Alabama, in Tallahassee, Florida, Tucker addressed the 1895 graduating class on the importance of duty. In his address, the president informed the graduates and the audience that, quote, to the to the one who deserves, who desires rather to serve his fellow man, duty is easily perceived and and the discharge of its attendant with pleas. Uh, this address went on to give the charge to the young graduates to continue to work professionally while understanding uh, their new roles in society. While the, with the arrival of Washington's approach uh, to black advancement in the South, Tucker's administration was all but over. For eight years, the FSNIS Sir, uh, president served as the educational voice for African Americans in the state of Florida. Available evidence shows that prior to Washington's speech in 1895, white state politicians supported Tucker as his approach was the only openly embraced in Florida. The goal of white conservatives was being achieved at FSNIS as the institution was creating, quote, a better Negro that ultimately served the black community by better educating them. On the other hand, this radical form of education prepared these pupils to think critically about their situations and gave them the analytical ability to devise a plan that would rescue their race from the shackles of white supremacy. After the Washington's Atlanta Cotton State Exposition Address that encouraged vocational and industrial education for African Americans, white conservative leaders attacked Tucker's ideology as detrimental to his race. From an outsider's perspective, Washington's idea of black education were out of state, were, were in step rather with white conservative as this approach would truly train a better Negro that would be more equipped to serve the white community. 
with an in-depth analysis of Washington and his methodology for black education, one will find that this overall desire, his overall desire mirrored that of Tucker and others who supported classical education. For example, historian David H. Jackson Jr. reveals Washington's ideology was a ploy to a night self-help within the black community with the hope of one day becoming self-sufficient. In fact, Washington adopted a survivalist approach that appeared to many black leaders such as W.E.B. Du Bois as accommodating to the white supremacy philosophy for edu black education. Clearly, Tuskegee's president gained support on a national level from white political leaders, which ultimately filtered down to local support from white conservative leaders. Not surprisingly, the tensions thus erected resulted in a troubled tenure for Tucker that, by the century's end, led him into direct conflict with the man who had acquired the state superintendent of public instruction position as early as 1897. That man was William, William Nichols Sheets, an Auburn, uh, an Auburn, Georgia native and graduate of Emory College. Sheets, a, uh, Sheets held a master's degree from em Emory College. He later moved to Alachua County, Florida, where he served as school principal for 16 years and as a county superintendent of schools for a dozen more. Surprisingly, or excuse me, significantly, Sheets had represented Alachua County as a delegate of the 1885 Florida Constitutional Convention and had authored the resulting charter's article on education. Elected state superintendent in 1892, he successfully gained adoption of the, quote, Sheets Laws, a statute that prohibited white and colored pupils to be taught in the same classes. As a regionally influential educational official, Sheets became familiar with Washington and was a firm believer in the Tuskegee man's advocacy of vocational education. Importantly, Sheets clearly advocated vocational education for African Americans in the state of Florida. One result of this philosophy was to create tension between him and Tucker, which eventually tossed, cost the president of FSNIS his position in, in, in 1901. Growing support for Sheets' vocational education uh, philosophy and Tucker's equally strong philosophy and support of classical education brought the two men into conflict from 1897 to 1901. A second gubernatorial term, term of, for William D. Blossom apparently blocked Sheets from acting against Tucker, but William Sherman Jennings' arrival in the governor's office in January 1901 finally opened the way for Sheets to push for Tucker's removal. The action uh, came in the late spring and early summer uh, when Sheets pressed the State Board of Education for a decision on Tucker's removal. Quote, he is, he is not in hearty sympathy with vocational education, the official complained to its members in requesting that Tucker's tenure end. Sheets insisted further that Tucker verbosely advocated liberal arts instruction. The FSNIS president, the superintendent declared, repeatedly had announced that, quote, vocational education shall not interfere with the literacy, uh, with the literary, literary work while he is head of the institution. Sheets added, quote, Tucker had, <coughs> excuse me, Tucker had criticized Washington and others, which he viewed as, quote, something detrimental to the school and his race. Finally, this saga was over as Sheets achieved his goal of having Tucker removed from the presidency of FSNIS. Subsequently, Tucker was replaced with someone who was perceived to focus on industrial education. In the summer of 1901, state officials submitted to Sheets request by removing Thomas Tucker and replaced him with a former employee of Booker T. Washington and the Tuskegee Institute, Nathan Benjamin Young. Ultimately, Young's appointment proved more disastrous for white supremacists than that of Tucker's because Young, also an Oberlin College graduate, 
proved to be a staunch, just as staunch a supporter of liberal arts education. At the end of Young's tenure as president of what became Florida Agricultural and Mechanical College, the second president battled white political leaders on issues that pertain to the curriculum of the institution. Young ultimately lost his job in 1923 for his refusal to implement a true vocational education curriculum. Nonetheless, Thomas Tucker was removed from office. Uh, from office, he left the Deep South and moved to his wife's hometown of Baltimore, Maryland. Two years later, the educate educator fell ill and died in June of 1903 at the age of 59. His legacy as a race and educator, educational leader remains intact in Florida over 100 years later after his death. While little is known about his life on a national level, his influence clearly reaches throughout the country. Florida a &M University has continued to produce prominent members of leaders of the African American community. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Ellis, for that presentation on, on the origins of FAMU. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning of the, the presentation tonight, if you have any questions, um, certainly feel free to type them into the chat. We'll work as many as we can. Uh, into our, our conversation this evening. Um, I do have a few questions that I want to ask you about in terms of SAMU uh, and then sort of moving forward in time. Um, one of the things that I think is kind of really interesting is looking at this balance between um, historically black colleges focusing on a very technical education. I mean, when you think about SAMU's name, it's agricultural and mechanical. And at the same time, focusing on what we sort of consider a traditional arts education. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how did historically black colleges think about this debate between trying to emphasize a mechanical or a technical education and liberal arts education? And how did they decide to really go kind of one way or the other? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the the book that I wrote on James Shepard, uh, the title actually I have to give credit to uh, my editor, uh, and I think she's on tonight, Sean Hunter. Um, uh, this concept the between Washington and Du Bois, and what in my research what I find is that black colleges and their leaders, their faculty, the presidents they were not necessarily caught up in the either or debate. Um, so you could go to Alabama or you can go to Georgia or even certain schools here in the state of Florida. And there may have been more of an emphasis, if you will, on industrial or liberal arts, uh, excuse me, industrial or vocational education, uh, because what they were figuring, what was most pertinent for our community and our needs in this era. Uh, on a statewide level, uh, when you look at in it, for example, here uh, with the Florida State Normal, this was really a mandate that came out of the convention uh, in 1884, where where these these African Americans were saying, "Hey, we need to develop an intelligent voting mass, and in order to get an intelligent voting mass, we need to have more black teachers." Um, and so I see Dean Watson on tonight, uh, and so. Uh, it, when you think about that, what they were really saying is we need to develop black schools throughout the region so we can have black teachers that will go on to teach black students. And so when every HBCU dealt with this, not necessarily this either or debate, what they did not, I believe, based off of my reading of the different regions, they what they did not want is to be told what to teach. They understood what their students need regionally uh, and locally. And so what they would do, um, and you can go back and look at James Anderson's The History of Black, uh, Black Education. He breaks it down better than anyone. But what you what you did see these these schools and these school leaders were masters at shielding or hiding 
what their true curriculum was. And so they, they, their curriculum may have said um, hus husbandry, for example, um, and so, or it may have said agriculture 101, for example, just to use, use that as an example. But when you got in the class, these, these kids may not have indeed been farming, but then on the other hand, uh, these individuals may have been in a carpentry class and, you know, uh, you go to Tuskegee Institute and you see several buildings that were built by these uh, students on this campus. And so this was a skill that these individuals had for the rest of their lives. And they go on uh, not only to take care of their families, but to build black communities uh, throughout the nation. Well, and I think you kind of touched on something really interesting there. You know, I, I am also a proud product of FAMU, you know, full disclosure, it is the best HBCU in the state of Florida. Uh, but one of the things I think is really kind of interesting about HBCUs is that there's a sense of, I think, importance and, and perhaps even a sense of pride, I think, around particular majors. Um, you touched on one of them as example in, in education. And I think, you know, nursing was something else that was also, there's a, a strong sense of, of pride in being a nursing major and, and being, uh, you know, in the school of business. Are there other majors at FAMU or at historically black colleges that you think sort of have that same feel that, you know, this is um, something that's important in, in the way that it's important for, for a community? I, I'll go back to the original um, education, right? It, when you look at the history of black colleges and universities um, as early as 1865, they're, they're what would be considered now their colleges of education were were really the the major producers of individuals who would go on to be professionals professionals when you think about the jim crow era prior uh, uh, reconstruction and the jim crow era and even perhaps the civil rights movement when you think about some of the most prominent individuals in the community, these individuals were black teachers, black principals, individuals with rising the rank to be black superintendents. Um, and these individuals graduated from HBCUs. I was just looking up today, for example, um, <clears throat> and something just popped up on my Facebook timeline. And I just realized that Herman Boone, uh, uh, the coach from the, the Disney movie, Remember the Titans, was a graduate um, of North Carolina Central in his physical education, um, for the education at North Carolina Central. So when you start to think about one of the flagship, from my assessment, the flagships of all black colleges will always be their colleges of education because it was the education that lifted African-Americans from one class to the next, and it's still happening today, right? It's still shaping and is shaping, but for example, Florida A&M University has shaped the black professional class in the state of Florida. Um, prior to Florida A&M, uh, shortly before that, you were talking about slavery, where it was illegal for black people to even read. Now you have this black college that's, that's, that's creating black teachers, that's helping to create black schools throughout the state of Florida, perhaps even throughout this southeastern region where we are. Um, and now these individuals um, not only have access to K-12 education, but now uh, 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 higher education uh, because of these teachers who were trained by individuals who graduated from what is now Florida a &M University. And you have that story throughout every state that has a historically black college and university. And I think that's an excellent point as well. And it kind of goes to a little bit of, of this next question. And, you know, before we came on uh, this evening, you made an interesting point that as a university, as an institution, um, FAMU is at the intersection of three really interesting dynamics. You know, one is certainly being a historically black college or university. Um, the other is being in uh, a capital in this case, in a state capital. And so it's a little bit of a uh, higher profile. And being, the third part, being a state-supported school, you know, as opposed to potentially being a private school. And I think given that context in terms of 
as an institution of you having those characteristics. I think it kind of gets to the question that, that Dr. Young is asking in the chat, which is, you know, what could you tell us a little bit more about um, uh, President Tucker's politics um, in terms of broader advocacy for um, African-Americans that were living in Tallahassee and in Florida, and maybe some of these other tensions or struggles that other university presidents have had given where, uh, from a from a, a cultural standpoint, where FAMU sits? I think that's a great question. And I'll, I'll talk about Tucker, but then talk about broadly what we see with black college presidents, particularly those from a historical perspective, and perhaps now uh, those individuals who serve as, uh, as state supported institutions of higher learning, right? So with Tucker, once he became president of, of Florida State Normal and Industrial, you don't really see him necessarily openly advocating politically. Um, um, and that was for several reasons, right? You, well, he didn't necessarily have to because he had Thomas Van Ranslar Gibbs on staff and Thomas Van Ranslar Gibbs was actually the individual who was doing a lot of the political lobbying and because of his connections uh, in politics. Um, I think that Thomas Tucker, like most black college presidents uh, during the Jim Crow era, uh, pre, he was pre-Jim Crow, but during the during the Jim Crow era, uh, understood that he walked a fine rope, a tight rope, um, in the sense that he didn't want to get the money cut off. Uh, but what I found interesting about Tucker, uh, to get to back to uh, Dr. Yon's point, he was, as you saw at the end of his career, he was more firm in his position in where he believed the university should go. Meaning he, so the university, when William Nichol Sheets uh, became the superintendent of public instruction, um, Sheets was really encouraging the university to change his curriculum. And Tucker um, was adamantly against changing the curriculum, although to try to appease and to slow down the movement of an industrial educational curriculum. He did hire several professors with that background, but he was opposed to it at all. I think that um, I think that w was the type of advocacy that he was pushing. Uh, that was the type of political advocacy he was pushing. Most black college presidents that I researched believe that their institutions and the curriculum that they had at their institutions was the best advocacy that they could provide. And so in many ways, they did everything in their ability to politically shield the institution in the way that they saw the institution um, from the political leaders of the day. And so they may not on, on paper, they may not have advocated uh, for other things uh, in the way that you would see, uh, for example, at a private school um, at Morehouse with Benjamin E. Mays, right? You would see him advocating more uh, because you know, he had different individuals that he responded to. And so I hope that answers Dr. Young's question. No, I think it's, it's certainly interesting in needing to kind of balance that sense of advocacy for broader issues and then also advocacy for specific resources for the university. And there's certainly, um, it, it is a little bit of balancing and perhaps some, some tension there. And something else I wanted to, to also uh, bring up in conversation is, uh, again, before we came on um, this evening, we were talking about um, some of the things that FAMU has sort of experienced um, over the school's history. Um, in terms of things that have happened in the state or happened in the city, uh, national events, global events, and, and the way that sort of impacted, um, the way that that's, that's essentially impacted the way that, that people come to understand uh, FAMU. And so my question is, uh, in thinking about what's going on right now um, and, and really everything that happened in, in 2020, what do you see as sort of the current perception of 
HBCUs of FAMU, and do you see that potentially shifting um, in, in, in any significant way? So, you know, we talked about this before we started, and, and I'll give you, you know, the, a briefer version of what we talked about. I think that it's an exciting time, honestly, to be at a historically black college and university. I think that what we saw in 2020 um, with the lynching of George Floyd for the world to see, and the world was able to see it, unfortunately, because we were all home uh, due to the pandemic. No one could turn away. And I think that for the first time, the world paused and saw what black people in America had been crying about uh, since before 1619. And I think now uh, with, with this, this movement of understanding the, this, this opportunity to say that that uh, uh well, not only does black lives matter you don't you don't just hear that from black people anymore you're hearing that from a broad scope of individuals around of the, around the world there's also an understanding now that hbcus matter uh that that hbcus have great relevance in 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 helping uh not just the black community advance but America could never, this is this is my understanding of what's happening, that America is now understanding that in order for America to truly be who America said it is on paper, that all Americans has, has to have the opportunity to at least try to achieve what that is, this concept of democracy. So when you start to think about the creation of Florida a and for example, the real reason what, that it was created was to create it and create or develop an intelligent voting mass. And so now, if you fast forward to 2021, what you are noticing is, is that individuals who are not African Americans are saying that black colleges have done a great job in helping African Americans go from one socioeconomic group to the next. And it is our job not to hinder that, but to support that. That's the first thing that I'm noticing. The second thing that I'm noticing um, that we talked about is that is that African-Americans, um, not only are you seeing first generation African-Americans looking at HBCUs now, you're starting to see an uptick of second and perhaps even third generation African-Americans looking at HBCUs now. It doesn't hurt as we talk, Keith, it doesn't hurt that the vice president is an HBCU alum, that several mayors throughout the city, uh, throughout the United States are HBCU alum, several individuals who are um, CEOs of, of Fortune 500 uh, companies are HBCU alum. And, and, it, and it doesn't hurt that these individual young people are saying, I wanna go to a place that I would be able to grow in an, uh, for four or five years where I won't have to feel otherized. I don't. I don't have to try to fit in, if you will. I can grow. I have a safe sp space uh, to develop into who it is that I will become for four or five years, and then and then go out in the world and be authentically me. The final piece is the Mackenzie Scott donations over the past several months. It in and you know reading. Uh, some reports that uh, Michael Lomax put out from the UNCF. What we are starting to notice is that there's a sustained level of giving to HBCUs that we haven't seen uh, since prior to, to 1915. So as I stated to you, Keith, earlier, I believe that if you wanted to make an investment uh, and wanted to get a return on your investments uh, several years down the road, I think HBCUs is a good place to put your money. Um, if there's a there's something from my assessment that is different that is going on in the HBCUs that we probably haven't seen uh, in, in quite a while. Absolutely, and I think that's 
the perfect place to leave the conversation for this evening. Uh, so thank you so much, Dr. Ellis, for your time and for um, sharing the story of, of FAMU's founding. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation this evening, we do have a program coming up next week on Tuesday at 5.30 with Dr. Darius Young. He's going to be talking about um, the history of FAMU Hospital. So I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening uh, for this fantastic program. Um, as I also mentioned, you're going to receive uh, a survey. Let us know what you enjoyed about the program, things that we can improve next time, anything that you would like to um, hear about as future topics. Um, and once again, we we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Hey, keep it. I may before I log off, I would be remiss if I didn't give a shout out uh, to Dean Allison Watson. Uh, my mentor, friend, associate provost of graduate education, Dr. David H. Jackson Jr., my good friend, Dr. Darius Young, and the great Sean Hunter from the University of Press of Florida. I want to give her a shout out. And I also want to give a shout out to Patricia Putnam. And uh, thank you all for everything you do with the uh, Florida Humanities Council, Keith. Thank you for inviting me, and I look forward to uh, future programs. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat>